everyone. Welcome to the first of our two-part manager training series. My name is Suzanne Spear. I'm the Director of Workforce Development here at ACU. And for those of you who are not familiar with the Association of Clinicians for the Underserved or also known as ACU for short, a little bit less of a tongue twister. We are a national nonprofit membership organization that is focused on the recruitment and retention of a transdisciplinary workforce in order to serve the access to healthcare issue. We were formed over 20 years ago as a National Health Service Corps alumni organization, and that remains one of our key focuses today. We have several programs that you can read about on our website at www.clinicians.org. But today I'm here because of one of those programs, which is our National Cooperative Agreement, which is our um, STAR Center, which stands for Solutions, Training, and Resources for Recruitment and Retention. And sorry, I'm having a little trouble, trouble with my slides today. And our this program is funded by a national cooperative agreement, or um, also known as a national training and technical assistance partner from the Bureau of Primary Healthcare, from, um, from HRSA's Office of Bureau of Primary Healthcare. So we are charged to, at the STAR Center, to develop tools and resources around the recruitment and retention of a clinical workforce. So if you haven't ever been to our website, or if you haven't been there lately, please go to chcworkforce.org to check out all of the free, yes, free tools and resources that we have there to, um, for, for you to utilize. Just a few webinar housekeeping items here. So one thing we want you guys to know is that we are recording. And this recording will be posted on our website after this. And so if you want to send it out to one of your friends or colleagues, um, you can do that. And it will be available shortly after this recording. Second, we want you to ask questions. We love um, interaction. And even on a webinar with a lot of people, we want you to ask questions and make it as interactive as possible because you, we want you to learn as you go along. And if so if you're interacting with us, you're probably learning, um, you know, answering your, we're answering your questions and all that kind of good stuff. So ask, um, ask questions. We would also love for you to, at the very end, fill out our session evaluation. We really enjoy and appreciate your feedback. HRSA loves for us to get that feedback and take it and incorporate it back into our programs. And so we would really appreciate it if you would fill out our session evaluation. And last but not least, we want everyone to have fun because even when we're talking about manager training, we still want you guys to have fun. Last thing as far as housekeeping goes, so if you have those questions that we encourage you guys to ask, you can either use the Q&A uh, box there at the bottom of your toolbar, or you can also use the chat function. And if you're using the chat function, please make sure that you select all panelists and attendees. And that way, everyone can see them, including um, the rest of the audience. Oops, sorry, jumping ahead. So we are thrilled today to have April Lewis of Good Connections Incorporated here. Talking with us today is our guest presenter talking all about manager training. She has worked extensively with health centers and we're thrilled to welcome her to the platform today. So with that, April, I will let you take it away. Thank you, Suzanne. All right, good afternoon, everyone. I don't know, maybe on the Pacific Coast, possibly good morning. Um, but I bring you greetings from Maryland. Um, thank you so much, uh, Suzanne and Michelle and Mariah for the opportunity to stand before your sit, <laughs> before your audience today and talk about something that's really critical and that's helping you all be exceptional managers and leading people in your day-to-day -day operation. So as you know, this is a two-part series. So the goal of our series is 
for today, we want to present to you the manager tool training toolkit that's forthcoming. And then we're going to some recommended manager trainings and skills for you to be successful in your roles. And then lastly, we'll conclude with how can you create a thriving workplace. So again, it's broken in two parts. And today our focus is on presenting to you the manager training toolkit. But before we get into all of that, as uh, Suzanne said, we want you to have fun. And I love that because I'm sure everybody is Zoomed out, webinar out, listening, learning, working from home. You know, one of my friends just wrote a book for HR professionals called The Pantsless Society. So we're all in this new space, but we do want this to be an engaging conversation. So using the chat, I want you to answer this question. What do you need to lead your team better? And if you happen to be on this line and you're not leading anyone just, just yet, think about the future. What is it that you need to be a successful leader? So we'll give you a few minutes of time into the chat. So what do you need to lead your team better? Or what did you need in the past in another organization or in another position to lead your team better? Time. <laughs> So you're going to start the session off really hard by saying time, but totally get it. Uh, we'll go. I have something special that I share about time management that we'll get into that later. I need more time to lead my team. Positive communication. Oh, I love that you said positive communication. Resources. Better training materials. So hopefully this will help you. Ways to engage new staff and keep current staff engaged on long-term projects. Love it. Time. So precious, and we don't always put enough into, yes, engagement, information and resources, ways to engage, the ability to remain flexible in changing healthcare environment. Time was my answer. So everybody needs time. Patience, understanding, and empathy. I love it. Performance management tools in a positive way. Tools to train employees, strength, support from leadership. That's positive. Keep staff on task putting my heart aside when having to address issues. Oh, I love that. I don't really know if it's possible to put your heart aside because we are humans. It's just about those boundaries um, and keeping the other person's best interest in mind. So I love that you even have that thought. Keeping staff engaged, support from admin, feedback tools, leadership cohesiveness, uh, the united front, um, staying professional, however understanding the level your employees are on. I love it. Thank you all so much for that feedback. To that end, I want to ask you one more question. All things being considered, what is one word to describe being a manager? Now, we're all adults here, so use the word of your choice, but be honest. Hard. That's a good one. Sharing the passion and importance of why things. Ooh, that, I love that. Bridging the gap between the why and the what. Team leader, coach, one of my favorite words and initiatives conflicting. Oh, you guys use good words and you're really summing it up. Team player. Absolutely. You're absolutely in it together. Difficult. That's a good mentor. Very powerful. I think people remember mentors more than anything. Um, advocate. Oh my gosh, that's probably my favorite so far. Ooh, make note of that, Suzanne. Advocate. Draining. I get it. Trust me. God through the unknown. Yes. Trustworthy. Critical empathetic absolutely so you all have like the best words ever words that i'm like some i haven't even heard of champion i call people on my team champion i love that motivating so as you see as you see for those of you that are on here you're probably seeing some similarities between how you feel and your peer leaders are feeling too um all around supporter absolutely so what I love is that most of what you're saying to describe being a manager is really the essence of how you take care of people. And that's your number one priority as a manager. Um, no, no technical skills were mentioned. It is all about who you are and how you show up to serve the people on your team. And that's so encouraging. If somebody put encourager, growing, you're absolutely always growing. If you get to the point to where you feel like you aren't growing anymore, then that's what we need to do some self-awareness and see what's stopping us because each and every day we, we should learn something and strive to get to the next level. Flexibility, dedication, evolving. So thank y'all. Keep those coming. We absolutely are going to keep a copy of the chat. And it's actually super helpful for the next portion for part two when we really get into um, engagement and what you can do to create a thriving workplace. 
So to that end, the workplace culture, we hear this term so much. We want to improve the organizational culture or we don't want to have a toxic culture. But what does that mean? Culture is one of those things. It's really an ambiguous term when you think about it. But culture is something, whether you're trying to or not, it is creating itself based off your people and based off how your people feel and how they show up and how they respond to you and their team members and what's being said, whether you hear it or not. When I think about culture, I think about all the positions that I've held. I'm a six-year Army veteran. I've served two overseas deployments. So the culture in the Army is totally different from when I got out and I actually started working in healthcare. And my first job in healthcare, I was a receptionist and we were focusing on diabetic supplies. So it was the elderly population, mostly dealing with Medicare. And that culture was very interesting because it was a lot of paperwork and, you know, making sure that we're doing everything by the books, no fraud, waste or abuse. But it wasn't a, let me train you up because you're the receptionist or let me mentor you because you just got out the military and you don't really know how to perform in the civilian sector. Now I did good, but it was all new to me. But it wasn't a culture of teaching. It was a culture that was task oriented. And then I started working in the VA on campus when I was a college student. And it was me in the office by myself working with veterans to get their education benefits. So I really can't say there was much of a culture because it was me just getting it done. And then I started working with licensed healthcare professionals with substance abuse issues. So in that role, I was really seeing a world that I had never been exposed to. I was seeing doctors and nurses and anesthetists who had drug abuse issues, who had substance abuse issues. And the culture in that place was all things supportive and understanding and healing. And then I get to community health centers and I started working at a community health center. And it was so amazing to be encompassed in a world where, it, again, it was all about service, helping people, regardless of who they were, where they came from, or what their particular situation was. It was all about treatment, making them well. And then from working at a health center, I moved up to the Primary Care Association. So the culture in that place, we had all these different technical people. Everybody was great in their respective role. It was a mixture of technical skills to lead the state of community health centers. So it was a lot of learning. It was a lot of training and development. And then I went on to the IPA. And it was two of us that ran the state's IPA. So it was us as two staff people and working with the health insurance plan. And we know how fun and exciting it is when we're working with health insurance companies, right? So it was a lot of data. It was a lot of data analysis, looking at reports, um, improving clinical, clinical measures. And it was a lot of money incentives based on performance. So the culture there was very fast paced. It was a lot of numbers. And then I made it to the national level where I worked at NAC. And at NAC, we're here. NAC had a staff of about a little over 100 and we were providing support to 1,400 health centers. So I'm saying all that to say that each organization that I worked at had a different culture. Essentially, the culture was built around what is it that we were here to do. So when you think about your team and you think about how you show up, think about do my people feel the way I want them to feel to do the work that they're here to do? I recently started working with a health center in California, and I had the initial call with the CEO, and it's about employee engagement. And I'll share with you, this is one of my favorite topics ever, because being in the military where you were told what to do, and sometimes the reason was because I said so, like when we were five, I appreciate when someone says, I want my people to feel connected. I want to have a spirit of camaraderie, camaraderie and unity in my organization. I love making sure that people are doing what I can to let people be inspired when they're in work. We have to be here all day, so why not make it a great place? So this particular CEO, when we were doing some, asking some discovery questions to see exactly what he needed and what I could do to support him, he said something that I'll probably never forget. And it was so simple yet profound. He said, I want my people to feel a certain type of way. Now, I love that. Knowing that we have to unpack that and see what it really means, what type of way, but I knew what he meant was, I want my people to be excited and energized and looking forward to the day ahead and not dreading when the alarm clock goes off. The immediate 
supervisor has so much to do with the culture to that one person that you lead, that one person that you mentor, that one person that you coach. And then that energy just transmutes throughout the team and onto the department throughout the organization. So that is how we have to look at culture as each and every person and the collective, but starting with one. So what will be coming down the pipeline soon and very soon is the Manager Training Toolkit. This is a document that um, the, the wisdom that the Star Center put together said, we want to give you all something to help you be well equipped to be managers, to help you show up and take care of your people. There are often times, and I've seen it, where we get promoted to manager or someone gets promoted to manager based off the need or their time working at the organization or somebody left and they need to fill the position. But how often do we stop and slow down? and say, let me give you what you need to be great in this position. Like many of you say it, resources. It is very, um, what's the word I can use? Intense to lead and guide and support and advocate for the most complex species in the universe, human beings. And I say that to normalize the stress or intensity intensity or conflicts that you have. You are in charge of a very complex being. It's more than just a person with a title. It's more than just front desk manager, lab tech, C uh, CMO. It's more than just that. It is absolutely a person that has their particular beliefs, that has their fears, their worries, their socioeconomic status, their family issues, their level of education and everything else that comes with being a person. So what we wanna do as best we can is provide you with some resources so you can feel equipped to manage them and lead them to get the job done. So why a toolkit? Why not just a webinar or why not just a recording or why not just send a consultant in and tell you all the things that you should be doing? It's because they wanted to provide relevant information to support health center managers and leaders. And the key there is relevant because there are a ton of documents and recordings and resources out there about managing people, the psychology of people, the art of communication, increased employee engagement. But we wanna to bring to you what's on the forefront of that information, what has data to support the findings. Everybody takes what they read and they dissect it in a different way, right? But we wanna provide you with information that's factual, that's relevant, and that's applicable. And we also want to use this toolkit to expand on existing trainings and resources that are already being offered through the ACU and through the STAR Center. I'm sure most of you, you're on their mailing list, you use their resources. I do encourage you to go to the website. I think we'll put it back up at the end. There are a ton of useful resources there to help you, to help your team, to really level up your workplace. And we also wanted to outline industry agnostic resources that are best practices. And I want to sit there for a second because after working in health centers, it was something that I always found in interesting is that we wanted to measure ourselves against our peers. We wanted to measure ourselves against the other health center, but it was always a little bit of reservation to look at the healthcare sector. When it is an industry of healthcare and it is business models that we all have. So when you look at something that's industry agnostic, you actually take the blinders off from just looking at your particular workplace. Now I understand FQHCs, we are very unique. We have a different um, set of compliance issues. Our fundings are different. Our rules and regulations and how we operate, yes, we have our nuances. But then when it comes to people, when it comes to communication, when it comes to those hard and soft skills, when it comes to engagement, there are some things that are just industry agnostic across the board, and we want to make sure you have access to those things. And lastly, we wanted to consolidate information from various sources. That's the beauty of a toolkit, is that it's not just one dimensional from one source. We pull together a multitude of resources and documents and data and surveys and best practices to help you be well equipped. I use the analogy um, in some coaching work that I do around mental fitness. Uh, my goal is to give people a mental toolboxes of, of resources, which means if you're dealing with something and you, if you're in the midst of a situation, if something breaks or it's out of order or you need to tweak it, you have a toolbox that you can go in and pull out what's necessary to be responsive. 
Now, I don't do a lot of manual labor. I actually don't do any manual labor. I like to pay somebody to do it because they're better than me. But I do know in a toolbox, the ones that I've seen are extremely junky. They have a lot of things in it. But with the person who owns that toolbox, whatever they need to fix, whatever they need to screw or turn or break or cut, they know exactly where to go to get it. This is what we want this toolkit to be for you. We want you to know as you're dealing with how do you advocate for your team, as you deal with conflict, as you deal with how do I manage my time when I only have so many hours in the day, as you deal with what we're going to talk about, your implicit biases and how you engage with other people, we want you to be able to use this document to say, okay, I have a new team member. He or she has never worked at an FQAC. He or she is great at operating this um, device, this EMR, but they don't understand a multidisciplinary approach to providing care. We want you to be able to go on this toolkit and get what you need. Leadership is unblocking people's potential to become better. What that means in your role as a manager, you're literally going inside of your team members and pulling out the excellence in them, the skills and the capabilities in them that they may or may not know that they have. But you saw something in them first on their resume and secondly, once they actually showed up for the interview to say, you have what we need. You would be a good fit for this organization, this team, and to get the job done. So always remember that it is truly about unblocking people's potential. It is truly about helping them become better. Now, the word better is objective, right? So when you don't say, oh, it's not a dollar sign or it's not a productivity number, it's not how many patients can the MA get through for the provider, it is better. Can you look back over the last 30, 60, 90, 120 days and say, I'm performing better or this person is communicating better? That's what you do with leaders. So who's going to benefit from the toolkit, right? You, existing managers, newly promoted managers. Again, being promoted to a manager does not automatically get you down the pathway to the training and development that you need. This toolkit will be a support for you. So if you have someone even that you're considering promoting or raising up in the workplace, I know a lot of um, community health centers, instead of promoting to different positions, they make a tiered approach, level one, two, three, or team leads. These resources will be beneficial for them as well supervisors of mid-level managers, and more importantly, the employees. When you are well-equipped and you have access to resources that help them, they're going to benefit from it. They'll never know that you're using a toolkit. They'll never know that you're researching on how do I increase engagement. As somebody said, positive communication, right? There's positive communication. There's proper communication. There's effective communication. So your team is going to be made better because you're doing the work to get better in your role and better in your engagement, understanding, empathy, and leadership skills. So what's inside this toolkit? To the left of your screen, you see a list of what's going to be available to you. We have information on manager skills, training for today's managers, and we say today because the workplace today is different from what it is 10 years ago. I don't know if any of you listened to Simon Sinek, but he, he, uh, his book was mostly known for his TED talk on under, or start with why, understanding your why. He has a very interesting speech on impact therapy. It's an interview, actually, where he, impact theory, I'm sorry, where he talks about millennials in the workplace. And he literally says, you know, millennials, and I'm at the start of millennials, so I consider myself a hybrid. Because some things people say about millennials, I just don't want to take ownership of it. But he says millennials were brought up in the society, right? They, most of them were cheered on by their parents. You're great. You're wonderful. You don't have to do a lot of work. You just showed up. You get an A for effort. And they aren't taught like their parents how to work hard, how to stay engaged, how to, you know, put in sweat equity. And then they get to work and say they want to make a difference and they want to have the impact and no one really ushers them through that process and then they leave. That's why millennials change jobs so often because they're seeking a certain level of fulfillment. They're seeking camaraderie. They're seeking purpose. They're seeking happiness. And I know a lot of us don't like to hear that in the workplace. But everybody wants to be happy at work, at home, in the community. How that looks like and how it shows up differs from, difference from person to person, but we all want to be happy. So we want to equip you with some uh, resources for today, leading people today. 
going to talk about implicit biases that have a link for you to take a test. And we'll get into that later. A manager training plan, because after you look at this information and you have access to it, we want you to take action. We want to absolutely have change in behavior. And we know that can't happen overnight. Most of you said you already have so much time to get this much work done. So if you create a training plan and you map it out with your supervisor, then you're able to move from point A to point B and see where you're going. Recommended readings and resources. I don't know if you've ever heard it, but leaders are readers. Reading is absolutely, in my opinion, fundamental to leading people. When you read, you open up yourself to worlds never seen. You open up yourself to different perspectives, different ways of thinking, different understanding, different viewpoints. And that sounds just like, like a team. They're different ways of thinking. They have different understandings. They have different viewpoints. So the more you read, the more equipped you are to be open-minded about certain things. Learn different information. My leaders that I will forever remember and hold in the highest esteem, they were avid readers. They were always like quoting things or referencing a book. And for me, I appreciated it because it said one thing. You don't think you know it all, so you continue to learn. You continue to seek out information, and then you share it with me. That's why those leaders will never be forgotten in my mind. Employee engagement and retention. On part two, we're going to go deep into that. I know a lot of you said that's something that you want to hear. It is absolutely critical. Coaching strategies. That was mentioned, too, in the chat. You absolutely are a coach. You don't need a particular title to be a coach. You don't need a certification, but you coach people. I'm a former athlete. I played basketball my entire life. I played basketball for the Army, and I actually was picked up to play for a semi-pro league in German, Germany, which was awesome to do what I love, play basketball, and get paid for it. And my best coaches taught me one thing. Use the resources that you already have and make them better. So I'm tall. I'm 5'8", right? And I'm pretty strong because I grew up with boys, so I was a tomboy. And I never really needed to go outside of my skill set versus using my strength and using my height to work with me. But a coach taught me that. When I first started playing organized ball, I was getting fouled out every single game and I was getting technical fouls, right? When you play ball at home in the community and then you go where you have referees, the same things don't fly. But my coaches, they saw the greatness in me. They saw the potential that I had. They saw what I was working with and they were able to lift that up. As a manager, as a leader, you do that with your people. We can't see the picture when we're in the frame. That's your team. So you being on the outside, you can see Sally has a really good way of explaining things. How can I use her to lead the conversation? Or you have a front desk manager that remembers every single patient's name, that connection. You can't teach that stuff. So you are coaching your team members in one way, shape, or form. You are looking at them, making sure they're in the right position, they have the right tools and resources, and more than anything, they know to play. The play is strategy. That means transparency, helping them see where are we going? What is it that we're working towards? How do we connect the work that you're doing to the bigger picture of us providing quality care to anyone, regardless of their ability to pay, regardless of their socioeconomic status? We're here to make people well. So you coach people in their respective roles, whether it's billing and collection, front desk, IT, community outreach, any other enabling services. As a leader, you're coaching them to excel so you can make your patients well and be an employer of choice. And then lastly, we'll talk about recognizing and reducing burnout. Um, we also have a link to a great resource that the Star 2 Center has available, a burnout assessment tool. Burnout is real. Burnout is absolutely real, especially in a healthcare setting, for a multitude of reasons, and we'll go into great detail about those. And we put recognize and reduce burnout because we often forget about the recognizing. You have to be able to see in the absence of someone saying, I'm burnt out, what it looks like. So how does a burnt out employee manifest? How does that show up in the workplace? And also for you. Because one thing I know about health center leaders and professionals is that we wear the S on our chest. We are all superman and we're all superwoman and we're all super whatever we want to identify with. But that does not mean that we only have so much bandwidth. 
I was giving an example last night about bandwidth. Um, I was coaching a group of individuals and they were asking, I have all these goals that I want to do. How do I know which one should I focus on now? So it's like a strategic plan. You have all these things on a strategic plan. You have timelines. You have people who are responsible for doing it. But then you also have 745, 8 o'clock when you open up the door. You also have your walk-ins. You also have the system going down. You also have your IT guy called out, your leading provider called out. So how do you stay focused? How do you do it? Remember that you only have so much bandwidth. Consider the bars for your Wi-Fi signal as you. The stronger you are, meaning the more bars you have, the more you can produce, such as the output of internet for streaming. So how do we weaken our bars? Over usage. We were just talking about Zoom and how Zoom struggles in the middle of the day because everybody is accessing the internet. It's the same with you and your team. If you're overwhelmed with your workload, you're taking away from your bar. One of the books that we reference um, in the toolkit is The Coaching Habits. It's a phenomenal read for anyone leading people. And one of the questions he asks, um, he trains you to ask is, if you're saying yes to this, then what are you saying no to? Because we only have so much bandwidth. So if you take on a new project or if you open up a new door to an idea, what is going to suffer, and I use the term suffer loosely, over here? You can only do so much. And as we all see, you only have so much time in a day. And as we talk about burnout, prioritization of tasks is key. Delegate where you're able to delegate. I used to do health center trainings, and um, I love COOs just getting into the work of the day, and they would always say, you know, I asked them a question, how many of them had more than 30 days of vacation and 60 days? And there were some health center COOs and ops leaders that had over 90 days of just like vacation. They never took vacation. And the number one reason was, I don't trust that my people will be able to get it done in my absence, or I don't think they'll do it like me. So they couldn't delegate. They didn't delegate. So my response to that is, how are you going to function and show up and be great if you're just exhausted? You have to trust your hiring practices and trust that you bring the right people on board so you can hand off some of that work. Because it's not just, oh, I'm handing off work so I have less on my plate. It is, I'm giving them an opportunity to be better. And that's what managers do. So what do you need to be better? You need a mixture of hard skills and soft skills. I am a soft skill advocate. I am that person that says, if you can read and write, I can pretty much teach you anything about your job if I know it, right? Or at least I can hire somebody to teach you. But I can't teach you how to smile. I can't teach you how to have a positive attitude. I can't teach you how to greet a patient. I can't teach you things that should just are, are just inside of you, your personality. So when you look at what skills you need as a manager and your up and coming manager, it is a balance of the hard skills and the soft skills. So when you think about those hard skills, specific technical knowledge, right? If you are in finance, you see we got budgeting on here, you should absolutely know general accounting practices. You should understand how to do accrual um, based it's financing, right? You shouldn't understand appreciation. If you are into, if you're in the, the clinical side of the house, you're certified. You should know how to put in the IV, very technical, specific things. Data and analysts, we can teach you that. We can teach you how to data mine. We can teach you how to read a report and what does it say so you can treat patients better or you can use it for your clinical decision support, right? Technology, very specific. You can teach an IT person how to code, how to set up an exchange server, how to make sure that the email is functioning and nothing breaks. Strategic planning, very specific. Making sure you have a good facilitator, making sure you're looking back at the previous strategic planning. And then we have the balance of soft skills that we need as well, communication. Communication is, I, I often say a lot of things are my favorite things. I equally love a lot of things, but communication is one of my favorite things. It is because I want to learn sign language. I want to learn ASL. I haven't been intentional about it, but I want to learn it because I want to be able to communicate with anyone, right? I, learning different languages is something that's on my list too. But my desire is so whatever message I have to give to someone, they can receive it in a way that I desire. When you look at communication, communication is a loop. 
it's not a straight line. A lot of people think and act as if communication is just the message going out to the receiver. That's half of it. Communication is when you have a message and you send it out to the receiver and the receiver understands the message in the way that you want them to and they take action based off what you're saying. That action can be understanding, that action can be something specific to go do something, or that action can just be the next step. But that is communication. And if you look at communication as an art and understand the mindfulness of communication, you start to see different results over time. You want to ask people, is what I'm saying making sense? Do you understand? You know, one of the greatest ways of knowing that you understand something is if you can teach it, or if at the least you can regurgitate it. So as you, in your management position, if you feel like my people just don't get what I'm saying, they're not doing what I'm asking them to do, we encourage you to take a step back. Are you saying it in a way that they can receive it? And how can you do a fact check by simply asking, does what I say make sense? Or does that sound good to you? You know, like not, do you get it? We don't want to be rude and abrasive, but we want to make sure that the purpose of us speaking is actually going to get the feel when they receive the message. Time management. So here's my secret to time management. You can't manage it. Time is what it is, right? I actually researched time and I was trying to get an understanding of why do we have a 24 hour time system? The universe is so expansive and so big. Who are we to just say nine to five work time, 24 hours, seven days a week? And it really started because of the train system. They needed to get trained, you know, in the same path so they wouldn't be running into each other, say bring in resources. And that's why we did the different time zones and things of that nature. So you can't manage time. You only have the time that you have. But what you can manage is your energy. Energy management is more impactful than time management. Because as the day goes on, you're going to get exhausted. Your team is going to get exhausted. We still have work to do. We can't tap out at 3 o'clock when we feel that, that exhaustion. But when you look at prioritization, how can I use the time for the best of my, to the best of my ability and prioritize accordingly so we get done the things that get done? One of my favorite speakers, and he's actually my mentor, Les Brown, says, uh, keep the main thing the main thing, right? So when you look at the day and you sit down in the morning after you have your huddle, so you're looking at your massive to-do list or your project management tool or your work management tool, and you're asking yourself, I, what do I do first? Everything is important, right? Prioritize. What is the main thing that needs to happen right now? And then the next step, what is the main thing that needs to happen second? Now, some things are always just going to be important. You, every now and then, you're going to have some urgent things. You know, Stephen, Stephen Covey, um, when he wrote in Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, we got urgent and we got important. And he stresses, rarely are things urgent. Now, in the healthcare setting, I think we have a little bit more leniency because things can be urgent. But when you look at your task and you look at what you want your team to do and you keep your eye on your North Star, your why and what you're doing, how can you manage your energy and their energy based off priorities. Conflict resolution is one of those soft skills that's absolutely necessary. Conflict resolution with your team, we have to de-escalate irate patients. I remember doing a session about that and the front desk managers, they were giving me all the examples of patients coming in screaming and things of that nature and throwing, throwing things. And you really have to understand how do you respond? How do you listen to the patient or to your team member that's being irate so you can respond? And emotional intelligence is right under that because even in listening to an irate patient or listening to your team member, or you have two team members that are going at it with each other, you have to respond from a very grounded place. You cannot rise up in anxiety and angst and anger because it's not going to make the situation better. So when you resolve conflict, when you learn how to resolve conflict, you're essentially being a mediator, which is a specific training that can be taught. Um, a lot of states do offer it. Um, and I was actually doing some research on getting them to come, you know, working with some HR professionals that I was working with. But conflict resolution is one of those soft skills that is necessary because every day is not going to be peaches and cream and cupcakes, rainbows and unicorns. And then empathy understanding and being compassionate about how people feel. I think we're in a state right now where everyone's empathy is a little bit more in, or increased than what it may have been before. We're all in a different place. The world as we knew it changed and it, in some ways it has changed forever. 
So we have to be understanding. Some people who may typically be bubbly in the office and always being that voice of positive energy, they may show up on the Zoom call not in the mood. But who knows why? We're dealing with things in a different way. As patients are presenting, people are terrified. We're in the midst of a global pandemic. People are still having to show up for work. So I'm an essential worker. I have to be here and I'm scared. So that may manifest in a different way. I have a um, workshop that I've been doing with a lot of organizations coping with COVID-19 personally and professionally. And I focus on what can we do within ourselves so we can take care of us, so we can then show up for our team and go to work from a very grounded, healthy state, mind, body, and spirit, because it takes the collective you being well so you can respond to the state of the emergency that we're in and adaptability. Everything changed. It's the only constant that we have is that everything is going to change. None of us were prepared to be told, go in your house and stay there. And some of us have been in the house for weeks, for months on end, right? So we've had to adapt because work still needs to be done. And your health center, PPE now more than ever, you have certain needs, you have financial needs, you have to train your people to be responsive in the midst of a pandemic. So as managers, you want to know how to adapt to the current situation. Looking at the situation as it is, gathering the facts and prioritizing accordingly. So again, we want a healthy mix of balance of those hard skills and those soft skills that you can need to lead your people. So for today's manager, what do you need? How do you make things happen? You know, it's different from what it was last year, the year before. Healthcare is an ever-evolving industry. When you look at our EHR versus paper charts, when you look at telehealth, I had a friend that goes to the emergency room the other night and she had her first telehealth visit. You know, they put her in this empty room, nothing in it, and they rolled in the cart and she communicated with the doctor. Very new. So we operate differently. So what is it that you need to be successful today? So some of the trainings that we recommend, and we go into great detail in the toolkit, but a few that I wanted to spotlight, change management. Again, going back to adaptability. When you look at change management, it is truly the ability to minimize resistance when change comes. So how can we do that? Transparency is one of the leading ways. If we know a change is coming down the pipeline, as soon as we're able to let our team know, we should. Now, there are some situations that, you know, can't be said until it's um, and the ink is dried, you know, the check cleared or whatever the case may be. But if you're sitting there in a strategic meeting and you're with your peer leaders and your executive leadership team and we know what change is coming, let's tell our team as soon as we can so we can minimize the resistance. Nobody likes change. We like to be comfortable. We like the familiarity of our day-to-day -day because change forces us to do something different and think differently. So if we ease people into the change, they'll, one, know that you aren't keeping anything from them and creating their own stories. And secondly, they'll feel as part of the project, as part of the movement. So change management is one of those trainings that we highly recommend as well as coaching and mentoring. Going back to what we were saying, like coaching, you're literally going inside your team members and pulling out the excellence in them, even when they don't see it sometimes. And as a mentor, I look at mentors, you know, in my personal opinion, is that person that you can go to for almost anything. And if they don't have the wisdom and the wherewithal in themselves, they know how to get you along the path. They know a resource. They know somebody that knows somebody. So how can you mentor your people? And to that note, I also want to just spotlight, you are dealing with humans. So again, it's a complex being. So yes, we have personal stuff that we leave outside the workplace, and then we have our professional things that we have. But keep in mind that we are a system. So some people want to learn how to be better leaders and communicators and better in their job, and some people don't know what they don't know. So as a mentor, asking those open-ended questions to get a better understanding of that person, you can equip them to be better in their particular role. Or if you see that the role that they're in isn't serving them well, then you can place them and position them accordingly. Those are good conversations that you have in that coaching and mentoring capacity. And again, the books that we recommend, and specifically The Coaching Habit, goes in a great detail about those questions to ask. So you as a leader don't always stay in problem-solving mode, rather becoming, helping the person see themselves in the situation and seeing how can they get to a resolve. 
Another training is performance management. The ability to have a conversation with someone and show them this is where you are, this is where we like to be. Here are some areas you excelled in, here are some areas that you need improvement. And let's create a plan that I can support you with to get there. So it's not just focusing on what's not working or what is just working, but the two together. And you manage that performance. Again, looking at what's not being said, paying attention to their behavior. Of course, we have concrete data from productivity to results and when we audit charts and things of that nature. But when you look at the performance, of your team member, how are they showing up? Are they engaged? Are they calling out now more than ever, right? Are we actually moving them up a progressive ladder in their respective skill sets? So you'll have to see, are there some trainings that we need to offer for them? And even for yourself, what can we do to elevate the team collectively? And implicit bias. And implicit bias is one that we really don't talk a lot about. I think now in the current environment, we're talking about it more. And basically, when it comes to implicit bias, I want you to remember this quote from Nelson Mandela. Learn to know yourself, to search realistically and regularly the processes of your own mind and feelings. That ties right into emotional intelligence. That ties right into to thine own self be true. That ties right into self-awareness. You have to know who you are so you can know how you perceive things, how you judge things, how you view things. And those things are people. We all have implicit biases. It is truly just the attitudes or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions, and it's unconscious. It's for me, for years, why I was terrified of dogs. And it was because one dog, Coco, who was a Cocker Spaniel, chased me every single day. So in my mind, I said all dogs are evil and they wanted to eat my legs. I was terrified of dogs. I didn't realize that Coco was just this little crazy Cocker Spaniel here and there were a ton of other dogs. But the way I engaged with dogs was different. The way I looked at dogs, when people say, oh, I love them, this is my fur baby, in my mind, I'm like, ew, right? Because of what I had going on inside of me. So your implicit biases, they show up involuntarily. You don't, you don't go, or for me, I didn't say, oh, I'm going to hate dogs today. No, it was just in me because of what happened, because of my upbringing, because of my experience. So your implicit biases can be favorable or unfavorable. Using that very simple example of a dog, it was unfavorable because I ended up having a dog later, right? And absolutely fell in love with my third baby. So some of them can be good and not so good. And awarenesses of the biases in the workplace do create a more inclusive environment. Because if there's a certain person or a type of person on your team that you have an unconscious bias about, you may leave them out because you're creating a story about them. So when you're aware of your feelings, of the stereotypes that you have, you do foster inclusivity in the workplace. It's hard to eliminate them. It is truly hard to think differently when something's just ingrained in you for whatever reason, but they're easier to interrupt them. And again, it's becoming aware. Is interjecting the thoughts and the feelings that you have about a certain type of person, a class of person, and you're being intentional about treating everyone equally to get the job done, including everyone as needed to fulfill the mission. And then it predicts how you treat other people. So we want to be sure that you as managers are aware of any implicit biases that you have. You know, they're not just race related and they're not just gender specific. As you go, um, I put the link here and you can simply Google it if you want to do this before you get access to the toolkit. You can Google the Harvard Implicit Bias Test and the Implicit Association Test. They, it was um, a project that they did and it has an array of tests that you can take to see what biases you have. I have a mentor, he's actually um, very prominent in the healthcare industry. He focuses on leadership um, for healthcare professionals. And his wife, she, he was giving her a segment on, you know, one of his speaking engagements and talking about the implicit association test. And she was saying, well, I don't have any implicit biases. I treat everybody equally and I don't see male, female, black, white, things of that nature. And so they were actually talking about it in a car and on their way to vacation. And he allowed her to take the test and she took one and she learned that she had a bias against women who worked. And she was like, how can that be? How can I have a bias against women who work when I work? I take care of our daughter. I love seeing women in leadership. 
but inside of her was the pain that her mom worked so much when she was a child, she never was home when she got home from school. Her mom was never there to see her through her extracurricular activities. So although she was proud to see women in leadership positions and going to work every day, she had a bias inside of her against women that worked because of her mom. This test will help you identify what implicit unconscious biases you may have, and it's only for the purpose of self-awareness. That's it. You only want to know yourself better so you can show up and lead your team from a very grounded, healthy, and informed state. So included in the toolkit, you'll have access to this document, which is a manager training plan. Again, we don't want to just give you a toolkit and leave it there. We absolutely want to help you create a blueprint. So just very quickly going through what's here, we'll, you're going to understand the competencies, and you're going to do this with your supervisor. So what skills do all managers? managers need to be successful, right? What is it that you need as the manager to be successful in your organization? Resources. What do we offer to support the learning? And this may be an opportunity to say, for many of you, you said you need access to resources. So this will create the space to have that dialogue. What do you need? Like, can we start doing some research and see, oh, we're missing the mark. We should maybe have a library or we should have, you know, trainings quarterly specific to certain topics like conflict resolution, right? Dealing with diverse teams, managing diverse teams, having uncomfortable conversations. So you will have the opportunity to map that out in your plan. And time. How do we account for the time necessary for the learning? So you're already saying, some of you, that you don't have enough time for the day, and then now we need to throw in training on top of that. So mapping out this plan in a strategic manner will help you answer that question. When can we make this happen? And then what learning activities will happen? What actually is going to be completed? You and your supervisor will have that conversation and then determine the outcomes. What impact will these learning activities have? Will you have a more cohesive work environment? Will you be able to handle uncomfortable conversations? Will you be able to maybe do cross training with people because you understand how to level set the conversations of each particular department or pod or things of that nature? It's going to be specific to your organization, your your team needs but this plan will help you create a blueprint so you can identify what training what resources that you need to be a better manager for your people to be the best manager for your people we also included recommended readings and resources I told you books 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 gotta love to read um, and in closing I just want to share with you we all know Peter Drucker the man who infamously said you can't manage what you don't measure the most important thing in communication is hearing what isn't said so when we look at communication, I say it's a feedback look, feedback loop. You put out a message, they receive it, they get it in a way that you give it to them, and they act accordingly. But what if they're communicating and not saying anything? These are some of the topics that we're going to get into on part two. When we talk about employee engagement and retention, how are your people showing up? your coaching strategies. Let's get specific on those questions. How can we get the answers that we're looking for? The quality of the answer you get is in the quality of the question that you ask. And then we'll go into recognizing and reducing burnout. And we'll see that there's a difference between being burnt out and being stressed. Our goal is to equip you with the tools and resources that you need so you can lead your team so they are engaged and so they stay with you. Retention is key. We want people to look forward to coming into the workplace. We want people to know that they have a trusted team and they can speak freely. We'll get into detail on all of this during our next session, which is Tuesday, next Tuesday. June 30th at 1 o'clock Eastern, and we're going to talk about creating that thriving workplace. So to echo what Suzanne said, please complete the session evaluation. Thank you so much for listening. I'll hand it over to you, Suzanne, to see what closing remarks, any Q&A that you may have. Um, and I wish you all the best in the work that you do. Stay well, and we'll be back on next Tuesday. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, April, um, for a wonderful presentation. And so we'll, we, we do have a few minutes, um, about seven minutes uh, for questions. So I know that um, we have people have been putting some things in the chat, but feel free to you know, go ahead and, and do that if there are any specific questions that you have. Um, and um, you know, we will 
put those, um, I will read those out for April. And in the meantime, in a minute, we are going to have the, there it is, the post-session evaluation there. So if you guys wouldn't mind, before you hop off, if you don't have any questions, or you don't want to say for any, if anyone else asks questions, please make sure that you complete that. We, again, we really value your feedback and want to hear if, um, if there's anything that we can do to improve on, 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 uh, in our future session. So while you're doing that, put your questions in the chat. And I'll give it a minute so folks can Wonderful. Well, even if there aren't any other questions that have come in, we want to make sure that we are leaving the Zoom open for everyone to have to complete that post-session evaluation. I think I did you see the one came in um, April did you see that one there was I think there's one question how to remove resistance and poor emotional mm -hmm. intelligence when the CEO has one when a CEO I'm thinking that says correct me if I'm wrong how to remove resistance and poor emotional intelligence when a CEO has one is that has poor, I don't want to misunderstand but is that has poor emotional intelligence and thank you all for the positive feedback. CEO is poor emotional intelligence. Team has high. Ah, so very interesting. Um, so in looking at your question, um, you know, I love that how you asked that. How do you remove resistance and poor emotional intelligence? It's really one of those things where in a perfect world, we can change someone else. We can say, we need you to stop doing this because. But more often than not, people are a little bit set in their ways until they're more informed or they see a different way of doing things. If the CEO has emo poor emotional intelligence, then that means the CEO may ha has, or not may, he or she has an opportunity to learn more about emotional intelligence. And then he or she will be able to connect the dot on what it is. And if your team has high emotional intelligence, you can use that as substance to why it's important to have it show up in the workplace. But the beauty around what you're asking is that if your team has high emotional intelligence, then they'll already be empathetic and understanding to the fact that your CEO doesn't, right? So they'll be truly walking their talk of emotional intelligence. So I would just say use it as an opportunity to inform and inspire based off the level of emotional intelligence that your team has. Give very specific answers on how they had to deal with the situation amongst the team or with the patient or something of that nature. So I would strive going down a path of education so he or she can connect the dot on why it's important and it's not just you know fluff word as some people say in the workplace but it's absolutely necessary so wish you the best in that conversation april can you speak to the books that you mentioned someone was asking about the titus oh the one that i referenced um and actually i think i can suzanne if it's well i'll have to get permission maybe we can show some of what we listed but i spoke to the coaching habits um it's a really, really good book. It's, it's super small. If you Google it and find it on Amazon, it's blue and red, very small book. I read it, I think, on a flight from here to Vegas. Um, and it's all about asking essential questions. So there are seven essential questions that the Arthur recommends. And the purpose of it is to help you as manager not automatically go into problem solving or giving advice rather than really understanding what is it that your team member needs? What is absolutely the problem? what is the greatest challenge for them and what is the best solution so it's really coaching them through problem solving and you being there as a listener and then one of the last questions is asking you know what did you get from the session so you can kind of get a barometer test right there and see did they get what they came in here for because more often than not people have the answers that they need they just need to work through it so i mentioned that book and i also mentioned the seven habits of highly effective people which um stephen covey wrote a lot of us are very familiar with which i'm pretty sure that was on audio on youtube so check it out 
So what if the CEO isn't interested in emotional intelligence or interested in learning about it while the team has a high emotional intelligence? How do you then improve performance, staff retention, strategy, growth? Um, that's a great question. What I would do is I would see the linkage in your CEO's emotional intelligence directly to performance, staff retention, strategy, and growth. So what do I mean by that? What is the CEO doing or not doing that can be objectively demonstrated into how it's improve, impacting performance. So the CEO is at the top with the senior leadership team, and then you have your team, your staff, you have mid-level management. So where is the linkage? And then very objectively show how the CEO's lack of emotional intelligence is decreasing performance by. Staff are leaving because, based off the exit interviews, they were saying they didn't feel when it comes to strategy. So I would use that as an opportunity because if the CEO isn't interested in it, then okay, let's move the emotional piece out and let's get straight to the fact. There are so many different types of leaders and some leaders are like numbers, results, productivity. So again, let's see how we can show the CEO how the absence of emotional intelligence is directly impacting those areas that you spoke to. And maybe something as simple as a survey, if you haven't done your survey, get the Again, the quality of question that you ask, get the quality of answer. So can we objectively show the disconnect caused by the CEO's lack of interest in emotional intelligence? I hope that helps. Um, is this recorded? Yes, it is recorded and it'll be on Star Center's website and the toolkit will be out um, soon. I don't know an exact date, um, but it'll definitely be out. And I'm pretty sure I don't want to speak from Mariah, but you'll all get a notice when it's available online. Um, yes, the coaching habit is written by Michael. Yep, it's blue and yellow and super small. Um, Wonderful. All right, I think that's everything. Well, thank yeah, thank you so much, April. We really um, had a wonderful time with you, and we look forward to presentation next week on creating a thriving workplace. And again, thank you to everyone for joining us today, and we will talk to you next week. In the meantime, be safe, and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Have a blessed day, everybody. Thanks, everybody.